Okay, now it's time to look at chapter 5 of the third canto from my book, Varaha, Vidura, and Kapila, Srimad Bhagavatam's third canto. Now, chapter 5 begins a new section of the third canto. This is the section that is about Varaha, the incarnation of Vishnu as a boar. The Varaha section itself has two subsections in it. One of is actually about Varaha, and that's the second section, and the first section is the prelude, the pre-story, the backstory that leads up to Varaha. Because Varaha is the incarnation who rescues the earth after it was created, but but wasn't used. So the backstory is how was the earth created, how was the universe created. So the way we get into this backstory is we had previously heard about Vidura and Uddhava meeting in Vrindavan and uh, discussing Krishna because Krishna had left the planet. And then Uddhava, and then Vidura asked Uddhava to share with him the information, the knowledge that Krishna told Uddhava before he left. But Uddhava said, no, Krishna wants you to hear from Maitreya. Go find Maitreya. He's not, uh, he's not far. So Vidura went to Haridwar, where Maitreya had his ashram, and he met Maitreya there and started to ask him questions. So, for example, he says, Vidura says, the whole world searches for happiness, Vidura asked, but we never find it. We only find hardship. But we cannot give up searching for happiness. What is the cure for this situation? Then Vidura uh, suggests an answer. His suggestion is, we suffer, Vidura continued, because we doom ourselves to irrelevant pursuits by not looking towards the all-attractive Krishna. Please show the auspicious path that will help us look towards the all-attractive who resides in the heart. So Vidura says, everybody's looking for happiness, but nobody finds it. But even though we only find trouble, we can't stop looking for it. So what's the cure to this situation? And then he suggests the answer. The answer is we're searching in irrelevant places because we're not looking for the all-attractive source of all happiness. So please, he's asking Maitreya, please give us some information that will turn our attraction and our attention to the all-attractive source of all happiness. Now, Vidura is pretty awesome, actually. He's going to suggest even more. He's going to, now, he's going to suggest to Maitreya where he could start. He says, well, you know, you could start by explaining how the all-attractive Hari is related to this universe. And this goes back to the theme that was developed in the second canto, the theme that the first step in spiritual realization is to see divinity in the world around you. In other words, and everything that you can already see, everything that you can already interact with, you have to learn how to see that in a divine way. Instead of looking off into some far off distance towards something divine, look right here. Look right in front of yourself. See the divinity that's right here in this world. So that's the first step towards really, really realizing God. And so Vidura is making that same suggestion to Maitreya. He's saying you could probably begin by explaining how the all-attractive relates to the universe. And I've heard that he has three incarnations as three different kinds of Vishnus to manifest the universe in three different ways. Can you please tell me about those? And he says, and also another um, thing that Vishnu does, the all-attractive does, is he appears within this world as Leela avatar. He appears in this world to show his playfulness, his sweetness, his attractiveness. So these incarnations must be very important for attracting our attention to the all-attractive. So please tell me about those avatars, especially the ones that especially come to attract people. And, you know, please also tell me how Brahma creates the universe and how he divides everything up. And then something cool happens here. Maitreya looks at Vidura like, 
well, you know, you already know all these answers. Why are you asking me this question? You know, you're the son of Vyasdev. You're an incarnation of Yamaraj, uh, the god Yamaraj. You, you know all the answers to these questions. Why are you asking me these questions? Your father is Vyas. Haven't you read Vyasa's answers to these questions? So Vidura, he says, I have read. You know, I've even read the Bharata, which Vyasa has just finished writing at the time. And I've even read that, and even that is not good enough for me. I want an explanation of the creation of the universe where the all-attractive Krishna is so central, so attractive, and powerfully will command my consciousness. Please explain it to me in that way. Vyasa has not done so, so far. So in this section where Vidura is talking like this, he says some really cool things I want to read to you. He says, When a sound describing Krishna enters the ears, it severs affections for the homely catalysts of material existence. Thus, if we nourish our interest in hearing about Hari, we will soon lose interest in everything else. Immersion in the pleasure of always remembering Hari will vanquish all our sadness. Oh, how I lament and lament the lamentable ignorance of those whose wicked fate makes them averse to discussing Hari. The unstoppable hand, hands of destiny's clock do nothing but diminish their lifespans through useless thoughts, words, and deeds. So after this, Maitreya says, Sadhu, Sadhu, your questions are so great. I'm going to be very happy to answer them. And then he goes ahead and he starts to answer. Following Vidura's suggestions, he's going to explain, first of all, how the universe is related to Hari. And so he explains the origin of the universe. I'll read you a section from that. The seer alone existed, Maitreya explained. He could not see the scene because she was dormant with her numerous energies suspended within her. Feeling incomplete without her, he desired, desired to rouse her and look upon her awakened beauty. Who is she? Her name is Maya. Maitreya explained, she is the one through whom the Supreme Seer expands. What are the energies dormant in her? The energies within her, Maitreya explained, are all the primary and secondary causes from which the Great One creates the universe. What happened when he woke her? After rousing her, Maitreya explained, the most virile, transcendental, original man impregnated Maya, the most beautifully qualified woman. With the seed of his potency, living entities and time. The seed of his potency is the living entities and the time. So then this, Maitreya goes on to explain that once Maya gets the potency of living entities, consciousness, will, in, in, in her, with time, then she changes from being avyakta to being vyakta. She changes from being potential to being kinetic. At first, she's just total, completely balanced. Her, her qualities are completely balanced and just completely neutralized. And they don't do anything, so they're called avyakta, or unmanifest, potential. But then once Vishnu puts the conscious wills in there and invest them with the power of time this the, that force of that will that's being put into this energy unbalances it and makes it kinetic then once it becomes kinetic it becomes something and then once it becomes kinetic it and then once it becomes kinetic it becomes something called the great totality or Mahat Tattva, Mahat Tattva. The Mahat 
or the great totality is this one substance which, from which everything else is going to be created. It is the consciousness of the living entities in, in Maya, in matter, in nature. It's a, it's an, it's a, a community, it's a unification or an amalgam of all the jiva's consciousness. And this force of will is the driving force behind evolution. So then, what evolves from uh, consciousness once, once it's put into matter, the first thing that evolves is called ahankar, Maitre explains. Ahankar means doership. It means the idea that I am going to do something for myself. I'm the doer, and I'll do it for myself. So as soon as consciousness comes into matter, it gets this idea that, oh, I can do something with this matter. So as soon as Mahat arises, then Ahankar comes. Um, and then, then Maya herself has three qualities. Maya herself has solidity or form. She has form and solidity. And she has power, energy. And she has perception or knowledge. Those are the three qualities of matter itself. The, they can be called tamas. That's the solidity and the, the form. And then there's rajas, which is the power and the energy. And then there's sattva, which is the perception and the knowledge and the ability to transmit sentience. So matter has these three qualities. When they're totally balanced, then, then she's called avyakta, and she doesn't do anything. When they get unbalanced by will, by jiva, then they go into different, they start to do different things. They become unbalanced, they become kinetic, they start to do stuff. So when the jivas get put into the material energy, as the mahat tattva, as the great totality, they develop this ahankar, this feeling that I'm going to do something. And what do they do? They use the different, the three different qualities of matter to do different things. So from each one of these three qualities, something different evolves under the force of will from the jivas. So from the quality of sattva, which means the ability to have sentience and knowledge, from, from that quality there becomes an evolution of mind and perceptions, perceptual powers. The universe be develops capabilities to express perception and uh, mental things, thoughts, feelings, emotions, that becomes possible by the ahankar causing sattva guna to evolve. Then the ahankar interacts with the rajaguna and it develops senses to interact with these, the world. The senses are like a further extension of the mind. And then the um, ahankar interacts with the tamaguna, which is the solidity of, of matter, to produce actual objects for the senses to interact with. You know, And then uh, Maitre even explains exactly how these objects evolve. He says that the, the, first, the first object to evolve is space. Space is the original element. Space is the original object. And then when Vidura asks him to explain how space evolves into all the rest of the objects, he says this. Space is tangible. Every object is tangible in some way. Space is tangible as waves of various dimensions. D dimensions, sizes, space. Space is tangible as waves of various sizes, various dimensions, high frequencies, low frequencies. These waves are revealed as sound to our hearing. After a long time, the movement of these waves thickens space into air, an element whose motion is revealed as the sense of touch by our skin. The movement of air generates friction, which gradually evolves into something very powerful, fire. Fire generates light, which reveals form to our vision. Light heats the air under the supreme glance, and after a long time, this precipitates moisture, water, 
which reveals flavor to our taste buds. Then, light heats water under the supreme, supreme glance. After a long time, this eventually releases sediments from the water, creating earth, which reveals fragrance to our nose. So that's how the um, universe evolves, from Hari's seed, which is the jiva and time. And then the universe evolves into all these elements, space, air, water, fire, earth, with the corresponding senses, sight, sound, uh, you know, the corresponding perceptions and the co corresponding sensual perceptions and the corresponding senses to interact with the things and the corresponding mental capacities to utilize all these tools. All this evolves over thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of celestial years. But it comes to a certain point, Maitreya says, where the Atoms have all evolved, the separated fundamental elements have all evolved, but they won't combine into any more complicated structures. We might call them molecules. So at that time, the sattva-guna qualities become personified as, and they pray to Hari to, uh, that we can't get any further with this evolution. We need your help to make all these elements combine. They won't cooperate. They won't cohese. They won't cohese together. So then they offer some prayers to Hari. I'll read you one of them. They say, Those eyes that stare far off at hordes of impermanent things cannot see the Supreme Master with their inner vision. They can never see the beautiful wealth of your playful, blissful pastimes. But those who drink the nectarian descriptions of your pastimes become fabulously wealthy with all-encompassing divine love. They completely comprehend everything about the very essence of renunciation and quickly attain your fearless abode. Please know that we are yours. Because of you, we have come into being through the three qualities of maya for the sake of creating the world. But we are unable to perform our functions because we cannot get the atomic elements to combine into complex forms. We want to succeed in our endeavors because then we can enable living beings to offer you food and partake of it also. So that's the end of the uh, fifth chapter. In the sixth chapter, we're going to see how this problem gets solved and what happens next.